Please join me in welcoming the Honourable Kevin Rudd, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Sid, and thank you all for being here this afternoon uh, in, uh, in Melbourne. China's growth model since uh, the late 70s, and if we're in the software business, we might call it China 1.0, uh, was along these lines. How do you develop uh, rapidly labour-intensive manufacturing industries for export based on China's principal uh, coastal cities in order to fuel the rest of the development of the Chinese economy? And how do you maximise that growth? And this model, uh, which China has pursued, based on strong investment and high levels of savings, uh, has been phenomenally successful. If you look at the economic record of the last 30 years, it has been a phenomenon. It's been a global phenomenon. That's China 1.0. It continues in large part today, but the purpose of this briefing is to go to where the Chinese now stand in terms of their new self-promulgated uh, growth model in the uh, 12th five-year plan, recently announced. It's got these characteristics. An emphasis on sustainable growth as opposed to growth at breakneck speed, an emphasis on growth being driven by domestic consumption as opposed to being driven primarily through exports based on labour-intensive manufacturers, based in turn on high levels of savings and investment. And furthermore, a growth which is reflected therefore in the explosion of the Chinese services industries domestically, most particularly in China's cities, but new cities beyond the ones we are classically familiar with, Beijing, Shanghai and Guangzhou and the coastal centres to a whole new raft of hinterland cities uh, which most people in this room, including myself, could not easily repeat the list of. This, if we're in the software business, we could call China 2.0. And the purpose of this presentation is simply to take uh, an audience such as this, drawn primarily from the business community, through our best analysis of what this difference means what it means for the futures of, future of China's growth trajectory over the next 30 years, and what it means in terms of new opportunities for Australian business. It is not as if the 1.0 growth model simply dies. It doesn't. But it does mean that it will be moving in parallel with 2.0, and that 2.0 over time uh, will in fact become the dominant trend within China's economic growth. The one thing you can say about the Chinese uh, is that when they set their minds to doing something, they do it. When they framed their first growth model, not long after the celebrated third plenum of the 11th Central Committee in November of 1978, and refined it between then and effectively uh, 1984, the subsequent 25 years or so have been one of rigorous, consistent implementation. Ups and downs here and there in terms of performance, but rendering on average uh, economic growth annually of between 8 and 10 per cent over a 25 year plus period. And the new growth model, China 2.0, has every prospect of similar success with a slightly reduced growth number, but frankly, growth being driven in addition now by new sectors of the Chinese economy. And that is the purpose, in a nutshell, of this presentation today. Now, he looks carefully for his clicker. I hope that it's here. Let's uh, put our minds back just 20 years. It's useful looking at this uh, comparative table of economic size about where countries like uh, China, Australia and the Kingdom of the Netherlands were back in 1990. Uh, China, Australia, thank you, and the Kingdom of the Netherlands were approximately of the same size. China slightly larger, Australia you can see, the Netherlands just behind. And as you can see on the table of um, global economic size, China coming in just ahead of Australia, Australia just coming in ahead of India, India coming just ahead of the Netherlands. That was only 20 years ago. Flick to today, or as it was last year, and you see some things have changed. 
and change quite dramatically. In this uh, calculation of relative economic size in US dollars current prices, uh, you will see that the United States remains the single largest economy in the world, 14.6 trillion. China now coming at second and just under 6 trillion. Australia, I think we're doing pretty well. We're nearly 1.3 trillion down below. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, back at 780 billion. Of course, the Europeans always cheat. They put all their numbers together. And so that's why you've got 16.2 trillion for the European Union. Leave that to one side. But in the national aggregations of economic size, you now see, of course, the United States first and China second. And ourselves coming in about a respectable 12th. Uh, this uh, is what has happened in just 20 years. Of course, in terms of the slice uh, which China's economy represents of uh, global uh, growth and the global economy, again, it's worthwhile looking at the changes which have occurred over the last uh, 20 uh, to 30 years. In 1990, you will see that China, a bit like Australia back then, logically, represented just under 2% of the global economy. By 2030, these projections put together by the US Department of Agricultural Economic Research um, have uh, China's growth or China's economy representing just under 20% of the global economy by 2030. Uh, this is an important fact because it underlines uh, one core reality. And that is everybody's business which is faintly internationally exposed now is has a direct line of relevance to the Chinese economy. If you represent one-fifth of the global economy, as China will do by, the, uh, by 2030, it follows that uh, this is going to be a part and parcel of your business uh, spectrum uh, across the world and of those that you trade or invest with. If you're not engaged directly with them, you can basically lay a bet that those who you're engaged with in business will be directly engaged with China. Going back to the relative size of the United States and China, the interesting one in these two comparisons of growth using the two classic measurements of PPP and current prices. Under purchasing power parity, you'll see that China, represented by the blue line, overtaking the United States by 2016. That's five years from now. Now, this is a significant phenomenon. If you go to the classic measure of uh, economic size through um, current prices, uh, then it will be a slower process. But if you look at the lines of intersection uh, on the left-hand side of the um, graph represented before you, the intersecting point will be somewhere between 2020 and 2030. The overall point is pretty simple. Whether you are using PPP or current prices, somewhere between 2015, 16, and 2030, China will be the largest economy in the world by whichever measure. What is interesting about the um, Chinese growth phenomenon uh, also uh, is the fact that um, we have rapidly rising incomes. In 1980, um, though that's not on this table here, China's per capita GDP lagged that of India, Indonesia and Vietnam. Today, 2010, uh, you will see that China's per capita GDP is about one and a half times that of Indonesia's, three and a half times that of India's, and four times that uh, of uh, Vietnam's. These are pretty significant because what we are seeing in China, frankly, is an explosion in individual purchasing power. Um, and this, combined, of course, with China's phenomenal population, uh, produces the sorts of numbers I've just referred to earlier in the presentation. But again, in terms of the success of the model, look at the relativities of per capita income only uh, 20 years ago in 1990, and you'll see China coming second last out of this quadrifecta. Uh, Indonesia, in fact, leading the charge. 20 years later, you see China leading the pack by a long, long way. As I said before, the Chinese growth model embraced back in uh, 1979-80 has been phenomenally successful in driving light, higher living standards across China, which has been near and dear to the political aspirations of the Chinese Communist Party, which is to lift as many people out of poverty and to provide a higher standard of living generally for its people. 
This is the second big phenomenon to observe. And that is the shift to China's cities. This is quite extraordinary. Because in the half decade we are now living in, between 2010 and 2015, uh, we are living through a momentous historical transition. Uh, for the first time in the history of the Middle Kingdom, for which we have something in the order of uh, four to 5,000 years of recorded history, more Chinese people will be living in cities than in the countryside. Uh, this is a global phenomenon, a phenomenon of global significance. Of course, as the trajectory goes out towards mid-century, it gets even more stark. China's urban population has increased by 446 million over the last 30 years that this current growth model has been pursued. That's a lot of people, given that there are only 7 billion people on the planet. That is, half a billion people have moved into China's cities over the last 30 years, or in fact created cities from nothing in some cases. The UN forecasts that given the current rate of urbanisation, China will reach 70% uh, urbanisation by mid-century. So not only do we have rising rapidly per capita income levels across China, and in its cities in particular, you're also seeing rapidly rising uh, urbanisation. And this is the second characteristic of what we've seen through the growth model so far. It's worthwhile also reflecting for a moment on um, what this means in aggregate terms uh, across the world because uh, the qu quantum of people in China now moving to the cities vastly exceeds since at least 2002-2003 uh, the number of citizens living in cities in Europe collectively and, of course, it has been the case for some decades now than in the United States. So this half billion people who have moved from the countryside to the cities over the last 30 years as an aggregate mass in itself is bigger than the combined uh, urban markets in absolute size of Europe as of about six or seven years ago and certainly than the United States and of um, uh, both those urban populations combined by the time we get to around about 2020. This is a significant fact again if your business is focusing on global urban markets. Here again uh, is a pretty significant fact that um, the relative uh, disposable income, and this is m measured in RMB terms, of China's urban population versus its rural population, 2009, uh, is pretty significant. You will see there a per capita uh, urban uh, income uh, or per capita urban income of 17,000 plus RMB against that in the rural areas of 5,000 plus RMB. So therefore, what have we got? We've got uh, rising per capita incomes across the country in general, a growing income disparity between rural and urban areas, as you would expect across development theory as it's unfolded in developing economies around the world in the last 50 years, but a very significant income gap here within the cities, uh, between countryside and the cities, and on top of that, a proliferation of the absolute size of the urban population as well. By the way, uh, one anecdotal observation uh, is as follows. This comes from McKinsey's, looking at the urbanisation pattern and these income patterns across China. Their estimate is that between 2008 and 2025, China will need to build up to 50,000 new skyscrapers to cater for this rapid urbanisation of its population. 50,000 skyscrapers. That's quite a lot of steel. Then we move to the relative significance which the economies of Asia, of which China is the primary driver, from a global perspective. And again, it's worth reflecting on these numbers as well. Back in 90, the combined economies of Asia represented a respectable 21% of the global economy. 2010, just last year, that had risen to 
By the time we reach 2030, we're approaching a figure whereby the combined economies of Asia represent one third uh, of the global economy. And a further projection out to 2050 has that lying at one half of the global economy. So the overall point is this, is that again, if your business focuses globally, and not just uh, on um, China, but on Europe, uh, sorry, on Asia in general, the relative size of global economic activity, which will be represented in the region to our north, uh, will become progressively globally more significant. So that by the time you get to um, 20 years from now, it's, uh, it's big. By mid-century, it's even bigger. But the significant fact within all this, again, is the uh, relative significance within Asia of uh, China itself. China now accounts for 35% of Asia's total GDP, 13% of its stock of outward investment, and 29% of its total exports. Um, these are important figures. China is the driving economic force within Asia, but because of the success of its growth model, it is powering the rest of Asia as well. An interesting further fact is that when you look at the combined economic significance of the economies of Asia, they do not primarily uh, depend uh, on markets in other parts of the world, in the United States or in North America, contrary to the generally accepted wisdom. Uh, as of 2001, more than half of Asia's trade was intra-regional, that is, one economy of Asia with another. If you look to 2009, that had edged up a bit further, approaching 53.3%, and so the trajectory increases again into the future. And so therefore, uh, the strong relative significance of China to Korea, China to Japan, Japan to Korea, etc., uh, is a phenomenon of itself. If you have followed the writings on um, the economies of Asia and China by Ross Garner over the last 20 years, Garneau, back in 1990, wrote a report, which we should all have a, uh, a read of, again, called Australia and the Northeast Asian Ascendancy. This is exactly what Garneau predicted back in 1990. Um, so it is, I think, important for us all to reflect on where that runs to in the future as well. And just to make it graphic in terms of individual countries, China's key trading partners... Where does China stand in the ra rankings of bilateral trading significance with the principal economies of Asia? So it's not just us where China became the number one trading partner as of last year. The same also applies for Japan, the Republic of Korea, India, as well as other significant economies uh, like Malaysia, a significant trading partner of ours. Uh, also, a second largest trading partner with Indonesia, with Singapore, with Thailand. Um, these facts underline China's significance not just to us, but frankly China's direct significance to every principal economy in rising Asia. And so what I've been describing so far has been the product of the Chinese economic growth model of the last 30 years, what I call China 1.0. This outlines the characteristics of what we might describe as China 2.0, the 12th five-year plan. And its qualities and uh, its, um, its um, overall characteristics can broadly be summarised in the boxes which are on uh, the slide before you. The Chinese government, very mindful of rising income inequality, uh, has decided for both political and equity reasons to do something about it. So they've decided to reduce inequality and improve the social welfare net within China. And I'll go to specific measures in a minute. But the overall intention there from a macroeconomic political point of view, macroeconomic, I should say, point of view, uh, is not just dealing with the social challenge of income inequality and poverty, uh, the overall macroeconomic objective is to reduce the requirement for precautionary savings. If you as a Chinese family are totally dependent on yourself 
for paying for all of your kids' education, paying for, paying for all of your health needs, for paying for or saving for the day where you may not have a job because there is no such thing as what was once called the iron rice bowl anymore, that is complete dependency on the state, then the only way in which you're going to get um, people to spend more by way of discretionary income and consume more and to save less is if the state steps in and provides these sorts of underpinning social insurances. And I'll come to the measures in a minute. But it is by doing that that the Chinese government intends to reduce what is an extraordinarily high savings rate by any international economic comparison uh, in order to boost domestic consumption, which they see as the principal next driver of China's economic growth into the future. You can't just wish it into being. You cannot force a consumer into consuming. You've got to cause the consumer to conclude that their basic social protections are in order and provided elsewhere if then if you're going to unleash the uh, spending power of Chinese consumers fully. This, of course, then brings us to the second characteristic of the new growth model, which is the boosting the services sector. Basically, as income levels rise, most particularly in China's cities, what you will see emerging is the same demand for quality services, uh, both from individual consumers and from companies and from uh, urban governments, that we expect in this country or have expected in this country over the last 30 or 40 years. That is, not simply the crude provision of basic goods and basic services, but across the whole range of services from luxury goods at one end uh, through to, um, uh, through to um, better education services as well. And this, again, becomes the principal driver, as it has in the economic development and economic evolution of most advanced economies. Um, Australia, half a century ago, you would have seen both the agricultural sector and the mining sector representing a much larger overall proportion of the national economic cake. Now we're overwhelmingly a services economy, and the same has unfolded across Europe and across North America. The same pattern is emerging here in China as well. That's the second pillar of this uh, new growth model. Within the services sector, um, there is a particular emphasis on environmental sustainability. If you've got a half a billion people moving into cities, uh, and if their income levels are rising, their expectations are for not just a nicer range of goods and services to buy, it's so that they can actually breathe during the day as well. That is, have clean air, have acceptable levels of environmental pollution, have access to clean water, have access to open green spaces, have an attractive urban environment. And as I've travelled around China in recent times and spoken to a whole lot of mayors and provincial governors, this is where their policy and political emphasis now lies. And this opens a whole range of interesting opportunities for Australian business as well. The fourth pillar of this new growth model is that it is not simply restricted to the major cities we're all familiar with, the mega cities of 10 million plus, like Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, etc., but in fact it's uh, concentrated now in what might be described as China's second and third tier cities, uh, all of which have a population in excess of five million. Uh, a question for everybody, how many Chinese cities have a population in excess of five million? Answer about 102. Uh, 102 Chinese cities with a population larger than individually Sydney or Melbourne. Uh, and that's where we've got to as of last year. These, therefore, are the underpinnings of the emerging Chinese new economic growth model and phenomenon, which, as I said before, is important for us all to grasp because it represents a whole new set of business opportunities for Australia, not substituting classical business opportunities but emerging across the top of them. I said before I'd refer to some of the specific measures which underpin in particular, the desire of the Chinese government to boost consumption through social protection. There are some of the measures. Pension schemes now covering 357 million urban residents. In the past, they weren't there. Also, increasing the insurance participation rate of three basic types of medical insurance for urban and rural residents. Now building an increasing number of government subsidised houses in urban areas for those who can't afford to buy their own. And this is a critical one, 
the increase in the minimum wage by no less than 13% per year, as well as increasing spending on basic medical services and rising payout limits for medical insurance. Now, you're familiar with all these debates within the Australian system over the last half century. Well, guess what? China's entering these debates as well. Let me just point to one of them, and that goes to the minimum wage and 13% annual increase. Um, the days of simply assuming that China will be perpetually a low-wage, labour-intensive, manufacturing country are numbered. It won't happen next year, it won't even happen in the next decade. But if you look at the pattern of Chinese manufacturing now, it is basically retreating from the coastal provinces where it was uh, located primarily uh, in the um, 80s and 90s and to some extent in the noughties in the last decade, moving into what might be described the central provinces, that string of provinces down the centre of the country, now increasingly moving to the west or, on top of that again, moving out of the country altogether into neighbouring Laos, into Cambodia, into parts of Vietnam, into uh, Myanmar and also in parts of Thailand. So the assumption that China will be, because of its population size, perpetually a low-income, labour-intensive manufacturing country will not always hold. When, of course, that um, source of domestic labour becomes uh, unaffordable for the purposes of China being, as it's been described for the last decade, as the world's factory, Bernie Delaney's looking at me in an anxious way at the moment in terms of BHP exports. It's OK for quite a while to come, Bernie. The... Um, um, when it actually comes, we do not know, but there is a clear trend unfolding. And I think any sober analysis of the figures uh, causes us to conclude that the business model is in fact changing as well. I said before that there was an explosion in China's services sector, and so there is. Um, and um, uh, there you see listed some of the services sectors which are uh, in fact on the increase. Uh, it's worthwhile noting that uh, the Chinese services sector uh, already uh, is the fourth largest... China is already the fourth largest exporter of commercial services globally. China is already today the third largest importer of commercial services globally. So this is not a phenomenon waiting to happen. It is a phenomenon which is now happening as we speak. Um, and it will simply become more intensified. So if you're in the aggregate basket of the services industries, this is a fact or an, an aggregate fact which is worth focusing on. I said before that one of the other emphases was on environmental services in particular. The Chinese uh, don't wish to strangle themselves. Therefore, they are acting on things such as global warming. They are acting on things such as um, other forms of environmental pollution. They are acting on things concerning the cleanliness of their water supply and the sustainability of their water supply. Climate change is affecting China. You see the availability of fresh water supplies being contracted in quite a large number of parts of the country. The melting of the uh, snows from the Himalaya, Himalayas also impact China. So here are the measures which they're embracing, just some of them anyway. Increasing the share of non-fossil fuels in China's energy mix to 11.4% of primary energy consumption. Cutting energy consumption per unit of GDP by 16% cutting carbon dioxide emission per unit of GDP by 17%, reducing water consumption per unit of value-added industrial output by 30%. Uh, these are legislative and regulatory measures which the Chinese are deploying to deal with their own environmental and climatic constraints. And these are now being rolled out across the countryside. China's emerging megacities, these are the ones with a population in excess of 10 million. Uh, as you see, they're not all on the coast. It's not just Beijing, it's not just Shanghai, but look elsewhere. They are, in, they are spread across a number of locations within the country. This is an interesting map, and it's worthwhile spending just a little bit of time on. And that is um, the emergence of uh, China's megacities and the significance of emerging provinces within China as well uh, when compared with economies around the world. China's GDP in 2009 by province, relative to the aggregate size of those provincial economies against those, say, of Europe and elsewhere, 
For example, Beijing um, right now represents um, something the size of uh, Singapore. Hmm. Who's is that? Um, Beijing, the size of Singapore, Hunan, the size of Malaysia, Shandong, the size of Switzerland, Guangdong, the size of Turkey, Jiangsu, the size of Indonesia. In fact, China in 2009 was the home of 21 provinces with a GDP of between 100 billion and 500 billion, with one province with a GDP between uh, half a billion and one trillion. So that's as it was in 2009, two years ago. What's really interesting, and this is data which has been assembled by HSBC, is you roll the clock along to a decade ahead in 2020. And here they forecast that China will be home to nine provinces with a GDP between half a billion and a trillion, six provinces with a GDP exceeding one trillion. Um, and uh, if you look at the comparisons, Zhejiang, just south of Shanghai, same size as Australia. Shanghai uh, will be the same size as the Indonesian economy. Go north of Shanghai, you'll see Jiangsu, uh, which will be the same size as the Russian economy. Hebei, uh, in and around Beijing, the size of the Korean economy. Shandong, uh, to the east and southeast of Beijing, the size of uh, Canada. And if you're really interested in coal out in Shanxi, it'll be the size of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then good old Sichuan out in the west will be the size of Switzerland. So what's the overall point here? The overall point that I want to make here is that when we look at this phenomenon called China, we actually need to, when we look north at the map of China, the economic map of China, begin to see China as, in fact, an emerging um, European Union plus entity with highly significant and substantial provincial and regional economies which need to be focused on in their own right because they are so big. And because of the powers which devolve to provincial governments and municipal governments worthy of separately engaging. If you're dealing with uh, the provincial governor and the party secretary of Sichuan in the future, think of yourself as engaging uh, the president of the Swiss Confederation. Mind you, given the politics of Switzerland, which is so decentralised, it's probably a bad analogy. But if you are looking at, uh, for example, uh, Zhejiang, uh, bringing it closer to home, that is something the size of Australia, uh, provincial capital, Hangzhou, um, a couple of hours southwest by road and rail, probably faster now with various uh, faster rail links. Uh, when I drove there years ago, 25 years ago, you'd basically bring along a spare camel to get there in a day and a half. But this has all been uh, changed radically in recent times. But Zhejiang, if it's the size of Australia, you think of engaging the various departments of the provincial government as you would engage uh, the various state governments of Australia, given its aggregate economic size. So my overall point is, sure, there is national policy. It happens in Beijing. And it's critical in terms of overall macroeconomic direction. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you about China 2.0, which brings these threads together in the 12th five-year plan. But in the application of this on the ground, it's worthwhile considering uh, how big each of these provincial economies is becoming. And therefore, if you are seriously engaged, not just in the services sector, but across, uh, let's call it the export or investment sector of the Australian economy, uh, the message here is... You need to go provincial, you need to go local, and not just central. Just about there. So what does that mean for us? What does it mean for you? Um, if you are engaged in these industry sets, um, there is um, an expanding, very large set of opportunities for your company and for your business. This does not assume that uh, the agricultural sector and agricultural exports to China have died they haven't. They'll continue and they will grow. It doesn't mean the mining sector, in terms of its significance of exports to China, has died or uh, is about to fall apart. No, it won't. But what I am putting out to you is that this whole new sector, um, on top of agriculture, mining and manufacturing, uh, is an area where we're seeing now a rapid explosion in China's uh, economic uh, growth performance. You can see the list there, but it's the aggregation of the entirety of the services sector. Um, basically, the top half relate to what you might describe as those concerned with the proper quality management of China's cities. Speak to any provincial mayor, any provincial governor. What they're saying to, you, to me is, our report card from the central government hinges on our performance against these things. And if we achieve success against these things, we get a tick and we get promoted. If we don't, we won't.
Furthermore, provincial governments also have, and municipal governments have, high levels of discretionary budgets now to deal with these things in what's called a feng chuan policy, which is basically a, um, a uh, partial fiscal decentralisation policy. So that, for example, in the municipality of Guangzhou will be in the business of uh, putting together competitive tenders of who can put together the best long-term uh, waste management system for the city of Guangzhou. I don't know what the answer to that is. But frankly, this is now number one, number two, number three on that provincial governor's or that um, municipal uh, government's uh, priorities. If not, the Chinese media, which if you follow it closely, is no longer exclusively centrally controlled, uh, though at uh, levels of control on questions of core political debate, it is controlled. But when the punters get upset in a city about waste not being properly collected, let me tell you, it filters out into the newspapers pretty quickly and provincial officials scamper for cover. Therefore, this is a real point of political pressure. And therefore, in terms of delivering real solutions on the ground, that work, there's a whole bunch of provincial governors and, uh, and mayors out there who want to be performing well and have the budgets available to them to perform well, so long as they can have confidence in the partners that they establish with Chinese and foreign companies. Um, to conclude, what's all this about? It's about being ahead of the curve. Those who pioneered what we did in China 1.0, which was the first iron ore sales to China, the first coal sales to China, the first Chinese uh, joint venture operations uh, in Australia, Chanar in Western Australia, these are put together by high-level political leadership in both countries. Uh, Hawke and Keating did a phenomenal amount of work on this score. Uh, and we at the embassy level, when I had an earlier safer career path, um, uh, did a fair bit of this as well. Um, but let me tell you, as we move to China 2.0, uh, it's going to require a whole lot of new effort. We can help to a certain extent, but we're not dealing with mass commodities. We're dealing with the services industry. It's a people business. And as a result, we not only need to be ahead of the curve and knowing strategically what is unfolding, your businesses need to plan for that over the next 10 to 20 years, use extensively, given the nature of China, the Australian diplomatic and, co and uh, commercial network, visit and establish a presence, as well as employing and engaging, because it is a people business, bilingual staff, whether it's Australian-born Chinese or whether it's, um, uh, or whether it's European Australians who speak Chinese, and very much be patient and look to the long term. That's the end of the story, and I'm happy to try and answer any questions you might have. We do have some time for questions, about 15 minutes, and if you wouldn't mind, I thought what we might do is take a group of perhaps two or three at a time. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Carl Jetta, City of Melbourne and Australia-China Connections. Uh, Jetstar announced yesterday um, daily flights from Melbourne to Beijing, and we are certainly extremely pleased to hear the announcement. It's a great benefit to our city. The question, Minister, is will your government assist in um, adding hopefully additional staff to the consulates and embassy in, in China and um, equally uh, maybe shorten the application forms for potential tourists so that we can benefit with the increased tourism that we deserve. Sure. Can I just hold and ask for another question? Over there. Please, over here. Uh, thank you, Minister, for a very insightful uh, presentation. I'm Sarah Yu, uh, Managing Director of Red China Business Limited. Uh, economically, we all now see uh, the importance of China with, with Australia, but just geographically or politically, is China still viewed as a threat to Australia? And why? Thank you. I like the loaded question. It has, with, it has within it the word still. It assumes that it has been in the past, but I'll, I'll address that when we get to it. So we take one more question um, before we get a response. Down the back. Thank you very much uh, for a very uh, informative presentation, Minister. Uh, my name's Mark Roberts from Davies Collison Cave uh, Patent Attorneys. As uh, China transitions to an innovation-based economy, it strikes me that um, having a very robust intellectual property system is going to be uh, very important 
I was wondering whether you have any thoughts about how Australia might assist China to continue to develop its IP system. Okay. Well, in summary, I've got um, tourism, IP and threats. Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me deal with it in that order. Uh, I'm glad you raised tourism because uh, I think where we are now in terms of Chinese visitor arrivals is about where we were with Japan circa 1978. Um, that is, it's all about to happen. Uh, the visitor numbers from China now, he scratches his head, about 400,000 a year. Nod, please. Someone nod. The, um, there you go. Um, but uh, the trajectory for growth uh, is uh, phenomenal. Why? Uh, tourism services, as you know, is listed in that uh, great list of uh, opportunities. Um, but it's going to require a whole lot of effort at multiple levels, and that is making sure that the tourism product we have for sale here is well developed and catered for Chinese tastes. Uh, we should not be lazy about our tourism product. We need to invest in appropriate hotel services. Uh, I'm often stunned by the underdevelopment of Australian um, hotel infrastructure around the country, given what is likely to emerge from the Chinese tourism market. And it will be across the spectrum from high income earners uh, to lower middle income earners who will be heading out of the country for their first holiday. Think about Japanese honeymoon in circa 1981. That's what we're about to look at. Um, but it's going to require a lot of planning. Don't just assume that Chinese folk are going to come here because we're a nice bunch of people. Okay? Um, the second point that you specifically raised uh, was about consular staff in China to service the volumes. Um, uh, we have a phenomenally large establishment in China now, and every time I look around, it needs to become larger. Um, so uh, all I can say is, yes, I appreciate the need, uh, and yes, here we go, subject to budgetary circumstances, uh, we will um, see what we can do. On the uh, final point, which is um, uh, visa requirements for getting here, uh, Chris Bowen, the immigration minister, is not with us, but I know Chris uh, is very keen to do what he can uh, to make this, frankly, an easier journey for people. Uh, Chinese overstays, frankly, are pretty limited. Uh, often one of the constraints that we have with visa relaxation regimes around the world is that certain countries, when folk come here on tourism visas or student visas, or short-term working visas um, that they overstay and creates a problem for the overall integrity of the system. That's not been our experience so far of China, so far as I'm advised, and I know the minister will be looking at how he can assist into the future. IP. Here's an interesting point. Um, guess who's exporting a whole bunch of IP to the rest of the world these days? China. Guess who has a whole lot of interest now in intellectual property protection? Um, China. Um, therefore, um, as they say in the Melbourne Cup, always back self-interest because you know it's going to be trying hard. Uh, so therefore, whereas there have been legitimate reservations being raised around the world about IP theft in China, something that the Chinese government readily accepts as a problem as well, there is a new change which has unfolded in the last several years as China is concerned about the protection of its own IP. Now, how can, what can we do to assist? There is an Australian who is now the head of WIPO, the World Intellectual uh, Property Organisation, uh, Intellectual Property Organisation, uh, in I think it's Geneva, uh, and therefore I know this is one of the things that he is particularly seized of, given the prominence of China in terms of the global economy, China in terms of prominence in the exploding, uh, let's call it um, uh, high technology sectors, whether it's information, whether it's ICT or whether it's biotechnology or in other sectors. And therefore, uh, there is a whole lot of work currently underway. Can I specifically brief you on where it's up to? No. But go to the WIPO website, see what they're now doing on this question. Uh, but I know it's near and dear to the hearts of um, a whole bunch of people here. Because, to be blunt, there has been theft in the past. Let's just call the spade a spade. But China now, I think, is rowing, uh, has a national interest in rowing in the reverse direction. On the threat question, uh, over to the lady over here. Um, I don't think that has ever been the view of the Australian government. Uh, like the Chinese government, we will always assert our national interests. Uh, and in the debate that I've seen engaged by a range of Chinese officials in recent weeks about Australia being a um, less than open investment market for our friends in China, my response to that, uh, to use a cheng yu, a four-character phrase in Chinese, is hu shuo ba dao, uh, which basically means nonsense, uh, politely. Um, 
And it's simply this. If you look at uh, the WTO ratings of all the economies in the world in terms of their degrees of openness to trade and investment, guess who comes out number three globally? Us. Look at the uh, Wall Street Journal's ratings of economic openness. Guess who comes out within the top five worldwide? Us. If you go to the facts and figures on China investment applications into Australia, the FERB in recent three or four years, I think, has reviewed about 186 applications from the PRC of uh, considerable orders of magnitude. 180 have been approved without reservation. Six have been approved with conditions. Uh, and the reverse question I would put in terms of... Um, uh, of uh, national interest concerns is, have you tried recently investing in Chinese agriculture? Have you tried recently investing in the Chinese ma mining sector? Have you tried recently investing in the Chinese financial services sector without restrictions? The truth is, in China, there are massive restrictions on foreign investment into the Chinese market. So, as we say in Australia, and I don't have the Chinese equivalent for this, fair shake of the sauce bottle. Um, there you go. Thank you. Let's, let's take another suite of three questions, please. Uh, Honourable Minister, Nicholas Grigorshin, CEO of Gasco, with the high Australian dollar, um, process engineering companies and manufacturing exports like Gasco are suffering a bit since April. Since Now, with the custom duties and VAT, when Chinese companies actually export into Australia, it's around 5% coming in. The other way, we recently lost a, quite a large order where it was effectively 17% 7, VAT plus 8% custom duties being 25%, which they could not get an input tax credit, which made it not com competitive. So I'm just wondering with the free trade agreement in the future, could this help this situation? Well, plainly Australian uh, exporters, whether it's in the services exports or in manufacturing, frankly, are suffering from the high Australian dollar. Let's just be blunt about it. It's just a fact. As uh, Bernie sector profits uh, immensely around the world, pumps up the Australian dollar, and as a result, um, sectors such as tourism, education, health services, services sector, and manufacturers are finding it difficult. That's just the truth of it. Um, I think a sober way through this, and I'm interested in your figures, uh, basically what you're saying is that combination of customs and VAT equals a 25% import impost on imports from this country in the sector that you are dealing with as against 5% in the reverse direction. Again, this is a fact which is useful in the overall national debate about which economy is most open to investment and trade and without uh, impediment. And we need some balance in this debate rather than some of the nonsense I've seen recent, writ written in recent times. One of the reasons why I've got a bilateral free trade negotiation underway is to frankly establish a level playing for both of us, uh, both in um, the... Um, uh, both in the traded sector of the economy, but also the investment sector, the investment uh, trade, the investment flows as well. We've now just concluded, would you believe, our 16th round of negotiations. It's been going on for four years. We can almost establish our own five-year plan um, in terms of these uh, trade negotiations. It's tough, it's hard, because uh, our Chinese friends are very uh, concerned and sensitive about the relative competitiveness of various sectors of the Australian economy. And I'm sure our negotiators are raising some, um, some, um, some uh, uh, reservations as well. But I think it's in all of our interest to conclude this thing as rapidly as possible, to remove some of these barriers to trade, unnecessary barriers to investment, so that, frankly, the level of inter economic integration between the two economies can reach, frankly, new levels that we haven't even dreamed of so far. To everybody's advantage. Uh, John Wallace, Asia Pacific Journalism Centre. It's a very exciting and challenging picture you portray, and uh, it's wonderful. I wonder whether you think we might be jeopardising our potential to uh, go on this journey by the way we uh, treat uh, Asian students studying here. And I'm thinking of the rather draconian, I'd suggest, standard we require of uh, many students to pass this IELTS test at a, at a level of eight which, from what I hear, means that about 3% of um, Chinese students studying here are able to actually pass that test. seems to me to be um, an unnecessary burden and reminiscent a bit of the white Australia policy and not quite right what, for what we want to do. Well, I, I don't think I'd uh, get into characterising it as that, mate. I mean, last time I looked, we had about 150,000 Chinese students studying in this country. Uh, altogether, if you put together the foreign student populations uh, from uh, parts of the world where English is not the first language, 
is something in the vicinity each year of 400,000 plus. This is a large number of students. I stand to be corrected on the numbers because I, I, I don't have it sort of readily to hand, but there are two nods in the audience, so I'm feeling better already. Um, now, on the detailed uh, application of uh, English uh, language requirements for study in Australian educational institutions, uh, that's something which, uh, frankly, is put there by the institutions themselves. Um, it's them, for them to judge what they can cope with in terms of greater numbers of students uh, with lesser uh, levels of English language ability. I can't, frankly, um, myself at a political level, prescribe what that should be. But I take your point because other concerns have been raised about visa restrictions concerning the education services sector. Uh, but one of the problems which has arisen has been the abuse of that sector, not by the Chinese, frankly, but by others, um, and by quite unscrupulous migration agents, uh, particularly when it comes to vocational education and training, which has led to a tightening in overall visa requirements. Uh, and I think what we need is a system of integrity. Can I also add one further point for those engaged in the education services sector? University, voc ed or school level. The number one thing which we will survive on in this business is, of course, price, but number, and there's the Australian dollar at work again, but the equal number one is quality. If we are very, very conservative and cautious in husbanding the quality uh, of the Australian education reputation uh, internationally, that speaks volumes, particularly when you've got increasingly high levels of disposable income in China where people were making product choices um, based on quality and less on price when it comes to sending their kids overseas to university. Australia has a huge number of advantages. One is proximity in the time zone. One is reasonable proximity in terms of travel. And it's good to see that Jetstar is doing what it's doing. And uh, I think a lot of airlines should be getting into this uh, across Australia's cities. Uh, but also... Um, making judgments about the quality of the education experience here. So if I was in the education sector, and I've spoken to many vice-chancellors about this around the country, the first thing I'd be guaranteeing is the, the quality and the reputation of the degree that I offer, uh, and those engaged in the regulation of these, um, shall I say, service offerings within education have to be very, very cautious about making sure that what we on offer is not fly-by-night, because anything that's fly-by-night and a bit uh, rusty around the edges, let me tell you, rep reputational damage flows to the entire Australian education brand. Yes, sir, I think we've got time for, for one more question, and then I'll, uh, I'll conclude. Is there one more question? A couple down the back here. I can take um, another... I've okay. got time for four fine. or five, if that's OK. All right, sure. Seeing my staff are looking horrified. Yes. <laughs> Someone fainted up the back. They probably are. Please. Uh, Scott Williams, I'm export manager for Carmen's Fine Foods. Just a question, uh, having recently been touring through China and, uh, and around the world a lot, um, just, just I noticed that you're, you're pumping up uh, Australia there a little bit at the end. Um, just a little concern about what seems to be the winding back of Australia and having whether the resources will be available out there to help um, up-and-coming exporters okay. and, and as well established exporters also. We, we might take another couple, yep. if that's right. So, uh, next to you. Uh, thank you, Andrew Nichols, DLA Piper Lawyers. Um, you mentioned before the importance of bilingual staff. Uh, Australian business will need bilingual staff to engage with all these opportunities offered by Australia China 2.0. What is being done and what can be done to improve uh, language education within Australia? One more question. Thank you, Minister. Paul Woppert from CPA Australia, and we are one of the education exporters into China at the moment with operations already in a couple of cities with a couple of other cities planned for shortly. Mine's a very practical question. It's what can we do to enhance uh, both the ability to repatriate profits and also what can we do to make sure that the simplicity of business operation rules and licences is enhanced so that uh, Australian organisations are able to... Uh, capture some of the economic benefits that you've so eloquently uh, put forward for us? OK, let's try and go to those three. And uh, given that I had my mic interrupted, I'm going to need some prompting about the subject of the first two questions. first one was on um, Austrade. The second one was on Mandarin language, Mandarin language education. And the third is repatriation of profits given foreign exchange regimes, etc. Um, 
Austrade, um, which is the responsibility of my colleague Craig Emerson, I think you will find across China is in fact expanding its operations uh, rather than contracting. In the recent Austrade review, what they've taken is a strategic judgment that in mature markets, basically North America and Western Europe, we need less people, and in expanding or emerging markets where the government sector is more important, we need more. And so if you go to the recent statements by the minister, I think on the uh, Austrade website, uh, you will see uh, that philosophy fairly strongly identified, the precise distribution of Austrade staff across uh, China. Uh, I... I don't hazard to uh, make uh, plain here in case I get some of it wrong. But I know having spoken to the Minister, that's his intention, which is in fact to redistribute staff to emerging markets where, let's call it the government sector, and uh, the dynamism of the economy uh, warrants it. And that obviously has China numero uno. Uh, language uh, skills. I think if you are in the services sector and you're in legal services... I think uh, language skills embedded in your China operations are just critical. Those of you who know me well know I've been banging on about this for 15, 15 years uh, and occasionally I just want to pull my hair out. Um, but I reckon the smart thing is this. Um, I often hear the criticism uh, from Australian corporates uh, that um, the problem with folk who've got really good Chinese, whether they are Australian-born Chinese... Uh, or whether they are um, you know, obviously Australian Chinese citizens, or uh, whether they are Caucasians like me who decided to have their own misspent youth uh, studying Chinese, is that if you're into the widget industry, like you are, um, in whatever you sell to China, uh, or if you're into um, the recycling of tyres, you can say, well, these guys are terrific, these guys and girls are terrific at language. They can entertain most people at a dinner party. They don't have a fig of knowledge about my particular industry. Well, my response to that is, so what? Your job is to train them. Bring them in, regard as a three-year apprenticeship, and teach them everything there is to know about the tyre recycling business or the widget business or the education business. Um, it's a bit like um, you know, attracting a raw recruit to any business. Just take them under your wing, remunerate them, look after them and teach them something they don't know because they've got services to provide to you that you don't have. And so I think we've got to the stage now with the explosion of a people-to-people -people business where this now becomes much more critical before than we've, when we focus primarily on agricultural or mining uh, commodities. Why? Commodity trade occurs, frankly, within a limited number of people. Uh, your negotiators, they sort it out. They're smart, they're sharp... And there's several hundred of them that, frankly, you could put into this room who basically deal most of the mining deals between Australia and China, or most of the ag deals, for that matter. The services industry, for God's sake, you're looking about tens of millions of people. Uh, and therefore, the importance of having people embedded to your operations who are comfortable in the language and cultures of China and the wider region uh, is really important, and it's an investment worth making. People then say to me, but they're not popping out of the universities in sufficient numbers, and some of the universities are contracting their teaching of Asian languages. Well, uh, business has to provide the lead by creating a demand factor, a pull factor, so that the universities say, come and do your four years of Chinese with us, or do your one year in country, you'll come out with a pretty good general education, plus you know, a law degree, an accounting degree, or whatever on the side, uh, an MBA. <laughs> Frankly, you've got a, a pretty potent box of skills there. But business has to take the lead in taking that bit of an investment risk in saying that each year we're going to take on someone or two people who are frankly equipped with these skills uh, and train them up. My final point about the services sector is this. National Broadband Network. One of the reasons why I've been so ideological on this for such a long period of time is because I have sensed deeply the emergence of the services sector export market right across East Asia, and the world for that matter. And therefore, uh, if you've got a um, bandwidth and band speed which is among the fastest and broadest in the world, which we hope to have through the NBN Co., then you've got a capacity to pump stuff up and down uh, the tube really rapidly. If you're in the design business, for example, and you want, you've been tasked with the job of redesigning three suburbs in western Changsha, one of the cities we're visiting, well, isn't it going to be a lot easier to be able to go, whack, there you go, it's all up the tube, give it to your Chinese language expert to make sure that it's all, um, it's all appropriately uh, rendered. Uh, 
having access to broadband given China's phenomenal access to uh, fibre optic uh, to the premises across most of the large cities of China, I think it will be a huge asset to Australian business as well. And the very final question on uh, remittances, this is a very complex question. It'll be locked into FTA negotiations as well and, bro and broadly the future of uh, Chinese uh, exchange, uh, Chinese remittance policy. But as the RMB progressively becomes a more internationally traded currency, and this is a very large macro question, then these problems will progressively be dealt with. But in the absence of that, we've got to look at better systems within our overall FTA negotiations. It's a problem. I understand it. A lot of companies experience it. There are ways around it. I'd suggest you find the relevant uh, one or two experts in this particular question, th say, through the Austrade office in Beijing. Thank you. Um, yes. I'm just looking for my staff. When, how am I going? One more. Okay, two more. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Marie Jockel holding Redlick. I specialise in corporate immigration and given the phenomenal um, importance of China to the world globally and of course to our, to our economy, uh, I'd like you to comment, if you can, on what I think is going to be a perennial challenge for us as a nation, given our demographics, given the, that with bilateral trade and investment come people, the very magnitude of the Chinese economy and their potential investment in Australia and growing investment is going to inevitably demand that more and more Chinese workers come to Australia. Our migration program is a whole of government response. It's not just the Minister of Immigration. It certainly would be something that you'd be cognizant of. And I'm just wondering whether you would be able to make any comments as to where you see or how we may be able to balance the very considerable competing interests with uh, bringing foreign workers, protecting our own workforce, dealing with Australia's challenging demographics, etc. Well, uh, these matters are constantly deliberated on within government, but uh, let me be very blunt, we're not in the business of saying if we've got um, you know, Chinese um, manufacturing enterprise X uh, or resource processing industry Y, which according to Chinese cost structures, can only be built competitively using um, uh, Chinese labour which undercuts Australian labour, uh, we won't do it. I'm just being blunt with you. Uh, it's not the way in which you build an economy. Uh, we have uh, an approach here which is uh, pretty consistent. Um, in fact, if you did that, you'd be undercutting a whole bunch of Australian businesses who have been long existing in the field. It's not to say, therefore, that uh, we have any hostility towards uh, welcoming uh, Chinese executives, uh, Chinese who are absolutely core to the running of business operations. That's quite a different matter, as we do with all countries around the world. But the idea of importing lock, stock and barrel, you know, huge... Uh, numbers of Chinese workers to work uh, below, frankly, award levels in this country is, um, is, I don't think, acceptable to the Australian community. And uh, this country has been developed on the basis of a fair go for all. Um, and we're a very open economy, but there's certain things that you can't go beyond, and I think that's, uh, that's one of them. But on the question of the proliferation of Chinese investment interest in this country and the expansion of the traded sector of our economy with China, uh, then of course it follows that using the normal business migration programs, etc., and the visa subclasses which exist across that, short and long term and permanent, uh, that there's a, there's a whole lot of flexibility there. And I'm not a migration lawyer, so I can't uh, answer in precise detail. I haven't looked at the Migration Act and the visa subclasses for business for about 15 years. But there are a whole bunch of visa subclasses which deal with these particular needs, I think it may go back to the question raised with me earlier over here, and that is, do we have, uh, frankly, uh, sufficiently rapid turnaround capacity uh, with uh, visa processing and visa issuing in China to make sure that we are not impeding business unnecessarily? That's a separate question to the one which is often raised, including by Chinese entrepreneurs, which is, we'd love to come and build a new port at Okoji in Western Australia. We only need 10,000 workers for four years. We only need to pay them 10 yuan per week, uh, and Bob's your uncle. Um, sorry, that's not the way we do business in this country. We've got time for one more down the back. Thank you, Minister. My name is Nicole Bernard, the CEO of China Crest Professionals, um, a business consultancy based in Beijing. Good. Uh, I, have, um, I would like your opinion on two sectors um, and the opportunity for Australian businesses in these sectors. 
And while they come from very different perspectives, they're both related to the better health of the Chinese people. Uh, the first is the ginseng. <laughs> One is the more asset-intensive and quality-sensitive areas of agriculture. Dairy comes to mind in particular. And also medical services. You spoke a bit about access to medical insurance, um, but how do you feel about the opportunities for Australian businesses to actually provide better access to the quality of care within medical institutions? Thank you. Sure. I will uh, give a pass on the question of um, ag in general and dairy in particular because um, the beginning of wisdom is to know what you don't know. And I'd rather not just um, hazard an ignorant opinion, even though I'm the son of a dairy farmer. Um, because um, uh, where that stands in terms of Chinese uh, regulatory standards, particularly after recent experiences with um, uh, a New Zealand joint venture company, I would rather be very cautious in what I had to say. Let me be more expansive about something I know even less about, which is the health services sector. Um, and uh, and uh, let me just make a very general observation. This country is blessed with the most sophisticated set of medical brains and medical technologies in terms of um, cubic metres of uh, intellectual property of any country of comparable size in the world. And it always stuns me that when our good colleagues in the education sector are out there, frankly, um, marketing highly effectively Australian education services uh, to the rest of the world, and China in particular, why in the health services industry this hasn't taken off in a similar way? What have we got in Australia? A high quality health system. What have we got? High qualities of medical and paramedical training. What have we got? We've got a whole bunch of, frankly, systems management um, um, uh, software within hospitals which make it easier to run you know, case mix programs, which make it uh, easier to run uh, patient um, uh, care modules which can be extended and applied across uh, various elements of the healthcare service, both in sectors of healthcare as well as geographically, and that in turn depends on uh, high speed broadband, often given the density of medical files. And having been through the national health and hospital reform process in the period that I was Prime Minister, I uh, have an acute sense of what this country's got going for it in this sector. So, my challenge to the sector really is, and without looking at the particular regulatory impediments, which still may need to be mown down at 50 paces through the FTA negotiations with the Chinese on this area of the services sector, I think instinctively with rising income levels, increased urbanisation, greater expectations of quality and longevity of life, uh, that the opportunities in this sector, which people tend to be fairly serious about, namely how long will I live and how well will I live in terms of my quality of my health, that this represents an enormous opportunity for Australia in the future. My concluding remark overall, as, um, as Sid winds us up, is let me just add one piece of foreign policy gloss over the top of this um, presentation, which has primarily been about business opportunities. And that is, in Australia, we do have a, a unique comparative, comparative advantage. We shouldn't overstate it, but it does exist. Um, it's not just the time zone. It's not just the fact that we run a pretty open... Uh, migration program. It's not just the fact that um, there are a large number of Chinese Australians now. These are all good things. But here we are as a, uh, as a country of Western civilizational origins uh, lying in this exploding hemisphere called the wider East Asia. The one that within 30 or 40 years will represent half of the global economy. And if you are looking for a country which is in a capacity to interpret what is going on in China to the commercial uh, advantage of other countries and economies around the Western world, uh, both in Western Europe and in North America, there are huge opportunities for this country to actually seize this by, uh, by the throat and to go for it. Uh, there's, there's a nice quality about Australians, not always, but I think we're there, is that we've got a bit of modesty about ourselves in this region. We know we're part of a region which is full of ancient civilizations, of high cultures, which have been around for thousands of years before we were even thought of, apart from indigenous Australians. Um, and I think having that attitude and that posture and that, I think, by national economic circumstances and growing and broad familiarity with the texture and complexity of doing business and respecting cultures uh, within wider East Asia, we are well positioned across the West, frankly, uh, to be um, uh, the smartest kids on the block. And therefore, um, there is a big team Australia 
opportunity uh, to be seen as such around the world, and that helps in foreign policy terms, but it also helps, I believe, in business terms, as we have seen to be uh, what I hope to be, and I've stated previously as my goal for Australia to become the most China-literate country in the collective West. Thank you.